Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness to us. Just celebrated uh, death, burial, and resurrection this Sunday, Lord. And it is so foundational and so fundamental to us. I hope we never get over it. Never think past it. May it be our foundation, that which we think about, the cross and the resurrection, the bedrock of Christianity, the most important law, for in it you, has, you have purchased our salvation, so rich, so free, and we, to say thanks, seem so little, Lord, in comparison to the benefit that we get. But it is not the benefit that we want personally that we want to exalt. We want to exalt him. For he is the one who's worthy. Yes, we get benefits. But we want to find our hearts in, enthroned and enthrilled with, with him. As we would look at our day day after day. Pray for the men. I pray that we're not apathetic. I pray, God, that we are not ones who are uh, status quo. Oh, that we be careful. That we are walking fully with you. Eternity is coming. Our time on this earth is going to come to an end. Oh, that we would live for him. So we come to you this morning, Lord, help us. Help us as men to get what we need to hear today so that we may walk righteously and uprightly and humbly before our God. We entrust these, uh, this hour into your hands. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in Romans chapter 13, and we're going to, to fish, finish, Lord willing, 11 through 14, and get into chapter 14, 1 through 12. So I have the distinct privilege this morning, Lord willing, to finish up one lesson and get into the, the next. So if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 13, we'll read verses 11 through 14 and continue on in chapter 14 through verse 12. Romans 13, 11. And this do knowing that the time that it's already the hour that you, uh, for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not carousing and drunkenness, not sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Now, Except the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One man has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. Let not him who eats regard with contempt him who does not eat. 
And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes a day, observe for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God, and he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Jesus died and, and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we shall, be, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Oh, that's quite a text, isn't it? We won't get to it all. We were in this text of Romans 13, 11 through 14. And we were looking, I sum it up all different ways in this. Uh, uh, verse 10 and um, uh, verse 11 is wake up. Verses 12 and 30 is clean up. And verse um 14 is grow up, I say. How's that? Yes, I have preached that before. But let's look at uh, verse 14 again in chapter 13. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you notice in verse 12 it told you to put on the armor of light? And now just uh, um, two verses later he says to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we came to that text of put on the light, we turned to Ephesians because Ephesians chapter 6, verses uh, 10. Um, uh, well, let's see. I don't know if it's really five. But anyway, um, we were dealing with uh, us being children of light. But here I want to look at the uh, armor here above putting on Christ. If you're putting on Christ, what does that practically look like? That's interesting. Okay. It's nothing like... Uh... All right. <laughs> Always these glitches in it. Glitches in uh, computers, right? Well, let's look at it. We're going to be putting on a Christ, and we want to look at Ephesians chapter 6. I should have known that if we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6, that the evil one would not like me to talk about that. <laughs> So I should have been praying that he may, may extra be exercised from the electronics, right? Ephesians chapter 6. If in James chapter 4 verse 7 it says, Submit to God and resist the devil and he must flee. And so the word resist is the same, sometimes uh, translated stand firm is found here in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. So what James summarizes, the latter part of the aspect of submitting to God uh, uh, and then resisting the devil, resisting is found in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 and following. 
Now you can resist all you want, but if you haven't been, if you're not submitted to God, then guess what? As the old country boy would say, you just left the gate open and you're letting the cattle out or letting the cattle go somewhere else. And so we need to shut all the gates. So if you are in, if there's an area in your life that you're not submitting to God, that's where the evil one is going to be shooting more. Okay. And so um, if we uh, are submitted to God, then that doesn't keep us from the evil one coming at us. But he can't, as I would say, and I'm using my own metaphor, if not scripture, he can't grab you. He can throw a, 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 a block down or a stone to see if you will stumble over it, but he won't be able to get a hold of you because you, you are submitted to God. Are you with me? So um, I'm using those kind of metaphors because it helps me. You know, it doesn't it, it doesn't say now because I am submitted to God that nothing the evil one's going to do nothing to me. Oh, yeah, he's still there, but he can't grab me. He, he has no hold on me. He doesn't have a place where he says, well, he's walking in the flesh. I grab that part. I can shoot there. But that doesn't even though I am walking with Christ, that doesn't mean that he doesn't try and he just can't be as effective as he could in other areas. So is it important for us to walk by the spirit and not in the flesh? Oh, yeah, because if you're walking in the flesh in some area, you are raising your hand in the spirit world saying, I'm over here. Come get me. So we want to make sure we are walking in the spirit that there's not a fleshly area that is that we're walking in sin because then that's easy for him. All right. So in Ephesians chapter six, verse 10, when it says put on the Lord Jesus Christ in Romans, I'm back now in Ephesians because I, I believe this is somewhat of a parallel that we don't. We want to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's many ways we could do it. And part of it is that we stand firm in the Lord. So Ephesians 6, 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, I think people read that and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you have a problem with, I don't know, your neighbor, your your coworker, your boss or whatever, and you're fighting against him and your thoughts are against him and that's only where you're thinking, you're fighting the wrong battle because you're just fighting flesh and blood. Yeah, he's, he's the one that's in your face, but if, if he's an unbeliever, even if he's a believer, can a believer be influenced by the evil one? I'm not talking about demon possession and all that. I'm just talking about influence. If we're in the flesh, of course. And so therefore, um, we need to realize that we do not fight against flesh and blood. That yes, we do in the sense that that's what it looks and that's what we have to face. But there's far more going on. OK, so I think the Apostle Paul is telling us in Ephesians 6, 12. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day. Did you notice he didn't say turn your back and run? He said, stand your ground. Now, there's times when you're in certain places that you don't want to be, you need to pack them. But I'm talking about when you are facing the evil one. You are to stand your gun. You are to resist him in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore. I think he wants us to stand firm. 
Notice also, I will say this, that the um, the armor, there's no armor on the back side of you. Do you notice that? It's all on the front. That's why he said stand firm. We don't have to turn our backs. If you're walking in the way, are you with me? The way that God, watch this, it, yeah, I'm in the Pilgrim's Progress now, walking in the narrow path that leads to the celestial. I'm walking in God's way. Then I don't turn and run. I stay in the way that he wants us to walk. I don't turn my back and, and, and pack them somewhere else. I'm in the way. I'm in where I'm supposed to be. Now, if I'm not in where I'm supposed to be, then I need to move. But if I'm walking in the way, if I am in that way, I don't, he tells me to stand firm. Now, these particular uh, armor that we're about to talk about are not something that you wake up in the morning and you can repeat in a verse and think you have the, the armor on. That's good to, to have them memorized. It's good to be thought. That these are things that are practically done in my life. Okay? It's not that I can just name them and I got them on. And those of you in the military, uh, you, you, will, you will laugh at this illustration. I mean, do you wait for a firefight before you put your armor on? That's nuts, right? You go, you don't have time. You don't have time to do nothing but put up your weapon and, and engage. So we have to have our armor already on when we're walking in the way. And just because we're, remember, just because we're walking in the way doesn't mean that I'm, I, everything's going to be hunky-dory. He will engage me in the way. But when he engaged me in the way, then, and I'm walking in the way, he has no way of grabbing a hold of me unless I, I allow him to do so by a, a fleshly thought or things. So, he tells us, stand firm, verse 14. Um, having uh, girded your loins with truth. It's not, well, it's in there somewhere. It's because you know the truth, because you have memorized the scriptures, because you have knowing what the truth is. So at the moment, you can speak the truth that, on those kinds of things. So that's my, I'm girded with truth because I'm a person of the truth, practice truth, person that doesn't lie. If I do, I repent real quick, right? Stand firm, having your belt with truth, having put on the full breastplate of righteousness. This is not the imputed righteousness. You have placed your trust in Jesus Christ that he has imputed to you, set down to your account this righteousness, but this now that which flows from that imputed righteousness it should be the practical righteousness by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what keeps us. That's what he means by the breastplate of righteousness. I practice righteousness by the power of the Spirit. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Where do you, when you go to places, <laughs> do you leave peace or do you leave carnage? Are you the kind of guy that, that always upsets the apple cart or when you, people say, well, I like him coming by because he always brings peace to the situation. Well, that's what we should do. But in addition, take, uh, taking up the shield of faith, of course, um, you take up the shield of faith because you know what the word is. And because you know the truth, you want to walk in the truth, you say, that's where I place my faith. In what God says. Even when I don't see it, right? If with which you have been able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one and taking the helmet of salvation. 
helmet of salvation deals with the concept of salvation past, present, and future. I have been saved from the penalty of sin. That's justification. I'm being saved from the power of sin, the progressive sanctification now in this life. And I will be saved from the very presence of sin, which is glorification. And I know those truths, and so therefore, <clears throat> I'm never hit upon the head and being disoriented because the evil one will try to disorient you, try to make you uh, uh, not sure of things, and then therefore he worms his way in and causes all kinds of havoc. I mean, if you were, I mean, think about a football game, guys. When somebody's bell been, has been rung, in other words, he has hit and he becomes dizzy. There, I could play football better than that guy at that moment, right? If you don't have your helmet on, if you're not sure of those things, then the evil one will pound upon you in your mind and you will be defeated. But if not, you say, no, that's not true. The Bible says this. And so therefore, you are steady on your feet. That's always is the place, or it's in the mind. Yes, the battle is in the mind, ultimately. And how it then affects you in uh, the physical life. Absolutely. It's, it's interesting. <clears throat> During that whole, what you just described, you didn't use the word hope at all. Because you can't hope, you have to know. Yes, and that hope that you just used, John, is a Texas hope, not a biblical hope, because biblical hope is the uh, conviction of what God says is true. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to stand on God no matter what. That's right. You, you can't hope that God's going to do it. You just know that God's going to do it. Sure he is. Yeah, that's right. And he does it through the participation of allowing us to step out in faith. That's why I haven't been in the military, but I have talked to military people. I mean, the worst thing, one of the worst things you could do is get encountered with the enemy and you're the only one. More likely that you are in real trouble. But if you have your squad with you, even if it's four people, there is a, the way and the methodology by which they fight that is able to defend themselves so much better. And that's why, brothers, uh, we're, we have a tendency to say, well, I'm going to do it alone. Well, you can't and be as effective You've got to have other brothers who love you, who care for you, who are willing to stand with you and through the thick and thin, because you're going to do it to them next week. And that you're able to call and know that you can call them and they're not going to think bad of you because you're going through some kind of fight. They say, well, yep, last week I was in that one too. Let's, let's pray, brother. And you come alongside, and the firefight is not as bad because you're with somebody else is with you. But there's a tendency for men to say, "Yeah, I'm a man." Well, yeah, you're a man, but you need help. And if you don't know you do need help, you're in trouble. As Paul say in Galatians, there are burdens for which. Um, we are to handle ourselves, but there are certain burdens that it's unbiblical to handle alone. Isn't that something? So, Paul is saying here, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and finally, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You have the truth. You know the truth. Now you use your sword of the truth by talking, by saying, by reminding yourself that what God says is what I'm going to do. So you use the word. And, you know, verse 18, most, a lot of people don't use as part of the armor. Maybe it isn't, but I think it is. And that is prayer. With all prayer and petition, praying at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, 
uh, on uh, being on alert uh, with all perseverance with petition for all the saints. A time of prayer. So I'm not saying this is the only thing about putting on Christ, but this is part of putting on Christ. And that is putting on the arm. We need to prepare. To give up is to put on Christ. And if we've put on Christ, we are now, we also have put on our armor if we've done it properly. And then we are to fight, make no provision for the flesh. Now, Paul doesn't mean uh, uh, the physical flesh that I'm grabbing right now, but the what Paul means, the hungers and propensities and um, thoughts and desires that flood my mind that are unbiblical. And I'm afraid that some men think, well, you know, nobody else has it but me. Nobody ever has these battles but me. And so they don't ever talk about it. It's like an elephant in a room. Every one of us have fleshly thoughts, X-rated things that, that bombard our minds that we have to say, where did that come from? Well, don't worry about it. Throw it out. Okay? And so that we are, are doing it. Guarding our minds. So turn to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 10, verse 5. These, this was my favorite when I was... Uh, young in the in walking with Christ in the 70s and uh, was was uh, battling it for the uh, finding victory because of God's grace second Corinthians 10 5 we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God so you're constantly discerning. Is this biblical? No. Throw it out. Now, sometimes it's like a yo-yo, right? You throw it out, it just comes right back, right? And you're doing this all day. You know, you're like you're playing with a yo-yo. But you're winning when you're throwing it out. You see how? But it comes back. I know. I know. <laughs> but if you don't think you're winning, you quit. And you won when you threw it out. Yeah, but it came back. I know. But you won. That's a big deal. And that's when it, when it gets heavy is when you call a brother, pray for me. I'm in the battle. If you call me, I'll say, in what stage are you in? <laughs> so I might be able to know whether I need to come over or whatever. We are destroying speculation in every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Man, is that a text. I can't tell you how much that helped me as a young person and even to this day of taking every thought. It, what does God say about this thought? You, that there's a tendency of men I've found over the years, well, where did that thought come from? And they try to trace down where it came from. I said, hey, it didn't make any difference where it came from. What are you doing with it? And the most important part is that you're throwing it out, not where it came from. Now, we can work on that if, if, the, if you're doing something that is causing you to have your mind to think on those things, but sometimes, right, right, men, you're not thinking about anything negative, not anything unbiblical. All of a sudden, this thought plops in your mind. You go, well, where did that come from? Well, don't spend all your time trying to figure out where it came from. Just throw it out, all right? Now, sometimes you know where it came from because it's stimulated by what you saw or what you heard or what you were thinking. And why would we men intentionally put in our minds something that we're going to have to battle with. It just doesn't make sense. You walk in this world enough and there's enough stuff that you don't want to put in your mind that you have to because you're just there or somebody says it or somebody whatever happens at work. Why would you intentionally go home and watch something or read something or hear something or listen to something that is adding to your mind that you're going to have to fight. Doesn't make sense to me. But guess what? I see it all the time with people. 
Now, I'm sensitive to this because I had to cut off everything when I was a young person. Well, I still, it's part of my habit. I just don't want to watch that. I don't want to listen to that. I'm not going back. You know, I'm going forward. But it's a discipline. Some people think you're nuts. It's okay with me. I, I want to live purely and righteously and holy. Ever, but if you're, if you're talking to a true brother who's doing this the same, he understands what you're doing. He knows exactly what you're doing. And if he doesn't, he's probably not doing well. I recommend the proverb. Yes. Proverbs 4.23. <laughs> you was okay. Oh, your heart with all the diligence for from it flow the springs of life. Amen. Amen. So what you put in is going to come out. That's right. One way or another. So guard your minds in these things. Why am I saying this? Because Paul is telling us uh, in uh, Romans that we should not be. Uh, we should uh, grow up. And part of that growing up is that we don't uh, find ourselves in the flesh. As he says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. What do you mean make no provision? Don't have an exception. What is your exception? Don't tell me. Because you know it. <laughs> Okay. What's your exception where you say, well, you know, I've been good. I've been, I've been throwing everything out, but you know, I can, I can go ahead and do this one. What's your exception? Make no exception for the flesh. You say, well, that's just the way I am. Well, that may be where you are, but you need to change. If it's flesh. Make no provision for the flesh. I wondered why he said that until I began to say, you know, I'll say to everybody else, because surely I don't do that, right? Everybody does. You have to fight. Make no provision for the flesh. No, not one. Well, just a little, little bit. No, no provision for the flesh. What a text, huh? Philippians chapter 4 is another passage that over the years has been okay because some people begin to think, well, then i got to think of the Bible all the time. I said, well, that's not bad. That would be pretty good. But no, sometimes you be in situations uh, that maybe uh, uh, you went to a concert or something. Of course, I, I try to bring thoughts of God into everything. But notice what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, beginning verse 6. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God. Then notice, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension. So guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So part of our guarding our minds is being in thanksgiving and supplication and in prayer to God. And then notice verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything is worthy of praise, dwell on these things. How about that? That cuts out a lot of things, but it also tells you what a lot of things that we can think about. It comes down to, again, what John, Don just said. It is the battle of the mind. And what are we feeding our mind on? Guard your mind and your heart. And then um, part of that is walking by the Spirit. We're again trying to explain what Paul means. Make no provision for the flesh. Well, notice Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. What am I doing? I'm trying to explain Paul's phraseology by the 
theology or biblical theology of Paul. In other words, I'm expanding what, what he's trying to say, making no provision for the flesh. How do you, because what are you going to say? Well, how do you do that? That's what I've been talking, talking about, right? The whole time here. But putting no provision for the flesh. Guard your mind and heart is the first thing. Second, walk by the Spirit. Galatians 5, verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. That's a very interesting uh, Greek construction there. It's, it's a double negative in Greek, which is the, uh, a certain way that they use this double negative. is by no means you will uh, uh, carry out the deeds of the flesh. So Paul is saying we need to walk by the Spirit. Isn't it interesting? What did they do in Paul's day? They didn't drive, they didn't drive cars or motorcycles. They walked as a general rule. Well, you might ride a mule or whatever, or a donkey. But usually you walk. So your everyday way of life is by the Spirit, by walking in the Spirit. The same thing is said again in verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. So Paul wants us to be involved with that. Um, Turn over to Romans 8. We're back in Romans now. Making no provision for the flesh. Romans 8, verse 3 and through 5. What the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and and offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Why? In order that, that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled unto, in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for the mind, uh, for the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Praise God. So, make no provision for the flesh. Guard your minds and your hearts. Walk by the Spirit. And finally, be, not really finally, but the, I, I've had to stop somewhere, right? Be alert and discerning. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be of sober spirit. I used to run over that real quick. But I don't anymore because I do pretty good by God's grace if I am aware, if I am alert. But when I just kind of put it on autopilot, I don't do as well. So these commands in Scripture now of be sober, be watchful. Hey, there's a little sign at my gym. It says... Uh, be alert. Be on alert. There's on something now that I go, yeah, I got to be on alert spiritually. And they meant some physical thing. But that reminds me. Yeah. Are all these scriptures in the notes? From yes, sir. The yes, sir. Yes, sir. So be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour but resist him firm in the uh, in the faith and knowing that the same experience of sufferings are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the, the world you're not the only one don't think oh I'm the only one that has this problem no everybody does be on alert of these things and then 
1 Thessalonians 5, and we'll finish up for the day. I thought maybe I'd get into the second lesson, but I didn't. That's all right, I guess. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. But examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil, or maybe better translated, um, every visible form of evil, right? Every what? Visible form. I mean, sometimes we can't avoid certain evil that comes our way because we didn't ask for it. But I don't want to, I, I don't want to go and actually uh, uh, and say, I could have avoided that, but I didn't. Some things you can't, right? So it's, uh, you can't avoid all evil because you live in an evil world, but I don't, I don't go looking for it. Yeah, I don't say, okay, I, you know, I'll go that way because that's where evil is. No, evil that way, not going there. So make no provision for the, for the flesh. Have you sat down and thought through what causes you to go to the flesh. Have you made a, a thought? I mean, I, I, it's, it, <laughs> this is hard for us, but I think it is profitable for us. It's like swimming upstream or paddling upstream. Who likes to do that? No one does. But we need to paddle upstream we need to swim upstream to figure out what are those things that lead me to fleshly activity. Instead of saying, well, you know, I blew it, this, that, and the other, and never analyzing, well, how did I get here? What did I do? What provision did I uh, indulge in to get me where I am right now? Because if you don't, guess what? You just do it again. So why not swim upstream going and say, why did I do that? And why did it do that? And where did it? Ah, oh, I could have stopped here. I could have stopped here. I could have stopped here. These are the red flags. But we don't, we don't swim upstream to think through these situations. I mean, I've talked to, for example, a man who, who was, um, had a problem with anger. I said, well... This is not the only answer, okay? But I'm, this illustrates in this area uh, a, a, a point that would have been helpful for him. Not the only thing, but helpful. I said, what were you thinking when you got angry? Well, okay, what were you thinking just before that? Uh, I don't know. Well, before that, I'm not for sure. Uh, I said, well, maybe you need to think about what ticks you off? Because there's all, I, I call them red flags. You st there's all of a sudden you go, mm -hmm. okay, that's why red flag one, you go, mm -hmm. cool. Then they're making me angry. And we pass through those red flags, we do nothing about it until we explode. Why not? I mean, it's so easy to stop a freight train at three miles an hour instead of 30. It takes a lot of track. So why not start there? Your problem was not that you exploded. That's the problem. It's because you went through the red flags. It was, you know, you should have said, I got to turn. I got to get off this track. So easy to get off the track. But you don't even know. You don't even know what caused it. You don't even, you're so uh, headstrong in that. You don't, have, you don't even see the red flags. So I'm going to ask you a question. Do you see the red flags in your, in your fleshly things? Do you know to say no? Make no provision for the flesh. And we do that by the power of the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the Apostle Paul. We rejoice in his giving us that we are to... 
Uh, it's a time to put on Christ to avoid the flesh. Thank you for his teaching. Thank you for the practicality of it. Help us, Lord, as men to live godly and righteously in an ungodly, unholy world. To the glory of your precious name, we pray in Christ. Amen.